wear your seat belt um, tighten it if you have any questions kindly put them down i would um, love to answer them at the end of this session okay so what are we going to talk about today we are going to talk about your relationship with money what emotions are setting you back why women have to bother having to talk about money anyway how to get your financial life in shape taking into consideration the situation that we find ourselves in so one interesting question i want you to ponder over today is your relationship with money have you ever thought about your relationship with money to be honest this was something or this is something that was is kind of new to me i had to sit down and think about my relationship with money and what i realized is that although it looked good it wasn't coming from a very good place and i'll share my story with you as we go along so what is your relationship with money now your relationship with money lies on a spectrum you are either an extreme frugal person who is so afraid of spending and so cautious when it comes to spending, or you are on the other side, so reckless. Someone even gives you money to hold on to for a second and you end up buying something with it. Where do you find yourself in this broad spectrum that we speak about? Are you a miser? Are you an extreme spender or you find yourself in between somewhere there? Ideally, a good balance is enough. When it's time to spend, you should spend confidently. When it's time to save and invest, you should invest confidently. Any of the, the two extremes screams insecurity in a very different way. Now, our money relationship is not something that we just pick and choose. Is based on things that have happened to us subconsciously. So a lot of us grew up in homes and based on how your parents treated money around you, how they spoke about money, their behavior towards money, how they spent money, they acquired money, even what they told you about money, that all affected your relationship with money. As I said, personally for me, when I sat down to think about my relationship with money, I am a, a frugal person, which sounds nice because I mean, I'll be saving a lot. But I realized that it was a place, uh, it was from a place of fear. And this is because growing up, when um, any spending, anything concerning spending comes up, my mom would just start saying, I don't have, and she would just start complaining about, you know, the whole thing, even though she has, she doesn't really want to spend it. So these are things that I picked up from her without knowing. So I tend to get quite worried about money. I like to see money in my account. It makes me feel secure. It sounds nice, but it's not really safe because there can be opportunities that will come that I would not take advantage of because I'm holding on to something because I'm so afraid of it. And these are things that I picked up from home. On the other hand, um, education. Now, who taught me about saving? In fact, today I went to the bank to take out some money for my investment account. And every time I go, the teller looks at my investment number and looks at me twice because that number is supposed to be for an older person. So what was I doing investing <laughs> at that time? And it's because my dad taught me how to invest, even though he himself was not the best when it comes to, to that. He taught me how to invest and he taught me delayed gratification. I remember wanting pizza and he told me that I should go and take money from my investment account to buy the pizza. And I think I did that and I realized the money was gone after I'd eaten the pizza. So after that, I learned to, you know, sacrifice my, my my want for something better. And these are all lessons I picked up, or these are all lessons that shaped my relationship with money as I grew. And now, as I'm saying, this is something that I wasn't really aware of till I sat down and thought through it. It could be your environment. It could be your experiences. For example, 
people who grew up in, you know, in hard economic times tend to be more careful with money than those of us who grew up with our parents giving us money for anything that we needed. We are not too careful with money. We believe that, you know, we spend it as it, it, it comes. And all these experiences shape, you know, our relationship with money. So today I would like you to think about your relationship with money. Throw or, or think about your past, your, your upbringing, the different experiences you've had, some that have really um, transformed you as a person. How has that affected your relationship with money? Are you in a good place or in a bad place? When you look at the money in your account, you see numbers. It's probably 5,000 Ghana CDs, 1 million, 5 CDs, wherever you find yourself, trust me, it's, it's fine. Money seems like it's just numbers, but it's not just numbers. Behind it is a lot of emotion. And the reason why there's a lot of emotion around money is because it determines the quality of life you have. It determines whether you eat or not. It determines whether you get good health care or not. It determines whether um, probably in Africa or most parts of the world, as a man, what kind of woman you end up marrying <laughs> and your options in life. So we can see that it's not just numbers. It's, it, it's something we need to live life. And because of that, money is driven by so much emotion. I'm sure a lot of us know the typical, oh, um, save, invest, do this, do that. But do we do it? Because it's not just logic. There are emotions behind the kind of financial decisions we take. But what are the emotions that are guiding your decision making? Are these emotions setting you back? Now let's touch on a few of these emotions. Jealousy. You see your friend riding that new Benz and you wonder why it's not you. Why do you have to come to the world to suffer? And so you decide to go and borrow or live a life that you cannot afford just because you are jealous of what somebody else is at. And because of that, you are always living from paycheck to paycheck. That if you have a paycheck or some money coming in from whatever sources, or um, you are taking debt or living a life that you cannot afford. And so jealousy is something that we have to be very careful of. Secondly, shame and embarrassment. We've all taken that one bad financial decision. And you know that financial decision that you cannot tell anybody about because you feel so embarrassed, like, oh, upon all the education you have, you did this. Shame and embarrassment can set you back. So it's very important that you forgive yourself for taking whatever decision that you took and acquire the right skill set and knowledge, build a good system around you and the right sentiment to move from where you are currently to a better place. There are people who made big financial mistakes, but they learned from it and then they, um, they learned from it and took the right steps and progressed. That reminds me about an example of um, a lady I met a few years back. So I normally reach out to clients when they are um, when they are retiring. And what I did realize from my list, because I normally reach out to clients who have a certain amount of money, what I realized from my list was that a lot of these people were men. So when I saw this woman in the top five, I was interested in finding out how did you get here? And I when I asked her, about her journey. It turns out that in the beginning of her journey, she made very bad, um, uh, she wasn't, she didn't start well. She didn't start well. Um, she um, was working in the public sector. She had a full 10 year um, career break. She wasn't saving, she wasn't investing. But one day came and she told herself that I am going to change the course of my life. And the result was what I was seeing years later. A woman who had retired with so much and even the amount I was seeing 
was not all that she had. She had so much more. And it was kind of um, an encouragement for me as a woman. So no matter where you find yourself today, no matter the setback, no matter the decisions you have taken, maybe you knew that this um, investment you were doing was a Ponzi scheme, but you did it anyway, and you are so ashamed to talk about it. It's in the past, it's gone. What can we do better in the future? Excitement. You hear about a promotion or some good news somewhere, and you get excited. You want to buy everything. You forget about your budget. That is if you have it one anyway, and you want to buy everything and anything. It can also set you back. So it's very important that you are aware of, of this emotion. And that reminds me, even though this has nothing to do with excitement, someone was sharing with me how um, in that time of the month, she spent so much. She just realized that she's just, her emotions are so heightened that in that time of the month, she spent so much, which was a bit weird, but she had to sit down and evaluate and see this is what is happening to me and do something about it. Lay all her accounts and do everything to ensure that she doesn't have access to money at that time of the month. Also, fear and anxiety. And this is where I was telling you that I sit. And fear and anxiety will prevent you from moving. It will prevent you from taking decisions. It will pre prevent you from taking that step. Because all you can think about is how you are going to lose your money. So you probably keep your money under the bed than invest. You probably never apply for that job because you are afraid that you will get rejected. But you would never make it if you don't try. So fear is also something that you also have to get very, um, you also be, have to be well. And for those of us who invest, let's say you invest in the stock market, okay? And stock investing in the stock market is supposed to be a long-term thing. And we all know that the stock, or if you buy shares in a company, the prices of the shares will go up and down. When you struggle with fear, as soon as you see the price go down, you easily liquidate the money. You quickly liquidate the money. And that is the time where you are actually supposed to be buying not liquidating, but because of fear, not knowing how bad it's going to be, you end up liquidating the money and missing out. So that's why fear is not a very good thing. Overconfidence, and I tend to find this with um, a lot of us in the financial industry. I mean, we think we know it, we think we have all the information, we are not willing to listen to anybody, and we end up making decisions that we could have avoided because we were overconfident. Even if you've done something well before or something has gone well for you before, in, in making a financial decision, put all the um, information on paper, think through it. If it's necessary, ask for advice and make a confident decision. But don't be overconfident. Not have enough of information and think you have so much and you know make a terrible financial decision. Read. The love of money is the root of all evil. We know the saying. And a lot of um, money decisions or how we acquire money is driven by greed. Not because we need it. We are just driven by greed. There's a story of this man in this book called Psychology of Money. His name is Gupta. Now, Gupta came from a very humble background. Um, but by the grace of God, he was doing so well. Um, he was very respected, making a lot of money. Unfortunately for him, he started comparing himself to Warren Buffett. And because of that, ended up taking some very poor financial decisions or involving himself in some illegal practices so that he could make more money. And that ended him up in jail. Everything that he had worked hard for over the years just went down the dream. So greed is something that we should be careful about. Yes, um, I, I believe in contentment. We should be content, even though we should be ambitious, we should be content with what we have. We should be very careful about the emotions that are driving our ambition. Taking all these things into consideration, I'm sure I've spoken a lot. My question is, I'm sure you're thinking too, why should we even be talking about money? I mean, we are women. 
And a lot of us have been raised to think that a man is our financial plan. Uh, plan. All you need is to secure yourself one rich man and all your problems in life are sorted. If this is you, then I'm just coming with a few reasons why we should be thinking about our finances as women and not relegated totally to the men. I don't also support us fighting or competing with the men when it comes to money, but it's something that we should be interested in and take part in making financial decisions as women. The first thing is life expectancy. Around the world, I looked at life expectancy for all the continents in the world, and not even one continent have, has the men living more than the women. In all the continents, women live longer than men. In Ghana, life expectancy as at best is 70, sorry, 65 for women and 63 for men. When you hit 60 at your retirement age, life expectancy is 18 more years. That is uh, 78 for women and then 16 for men. So it means that you are likely to outlive your partner. So if you are going to relegate all the financial decisions to him, what happens if he's no more? That is when you see people crying at a funeral, some not because they love their husband and he's gone, but because their bank account has disappeared. And so we need to start thinking about our finances. What if you live longer than your significant other? What are you going to do? Also, a lot of women are primary caregivers. As I, I mentioned to you, I picked my relationship with money or some of my money um, habits from my mom. And a lot of us are primary caregivers. So what kind of um, what are you passing on to your children? If you don't know how to manage money, if you're just spending, if you're, you are not managing money wisely, what are you passing on to your children? It's interesting because I was just looking at my husband's family and um, even though his father talks to them a lot about money, funny enough, they all took after their mom when it comes to my money because the mom spend more time with them. So as parents and as moms, what kind of financial habits are we passing on to our children? If we are better financially, we also pass on better habits to our children. So this is one of the reasons. Also life-changing events. Um, as we, we all know here, a lot of us are here because we've had to take career breaks, um, either to take care of kids or take care of our parents, or it could be unemployment, but for whatever reason, there has been some life-changing event that has caused us to have to take financial breaks. And all these things have implications on our overall financial well-being, the kind of retirement we have, the kind of um, lifestyle we have, and all that, the kind of options we have as women. And so because of this, we even need to be more intentional about our limited resources. Also, um, we are major, it's said that we are major dec um, decision makers when it comes to allocation of our household resources. So maybe your husband gives you some money to do some shopping, you know, for the family on a monthly basis. You realize that the family finances is affected by how you spend that money. If you blow it, you realize that a lot of the time the family is caught if you don't blow it and you manage it well, sometimes when um, the husband is not doing too well, guess what? Wife has some money there to support the family and to move the family to, you know, or to help the family achieve whatever financial goal they set for themselves or to achieve, um, to create wealth for themselves. So we take the major day-to-day -day decisions most of the time when it comes to money. So how we manage money is important. And the education we have when it comes to our finances is also important. And last but not the least, we earn lower than the men do. There are so many factors that, you know, but worldwide, women earn lower than the men do, which means that um, in terms of our retirement, 
we need to put in more effort because we'll be living longer than the men anyway. Um, um, and, and all these have an impact on our overall financial outcome. So it's very important that with the little we have, we are able to manage it well. And when it comes to finances, let me mention, it's really, really not about how much you earn. It's about what you do with what you have. A houseboy somewhere can be richer than his master. It's all about um, have spending less than you earn and investing it. So if the master earns 1.2 million and spends 1.3 million, and the houseboy earns 500 CDs and spends 100 CDs, when there's an emergency, both lose jobs. The houseboy probably would be able to survive for a while while the master may struggle. So it's never really about how much you earn, it's about what you do with it. So how do I get my financial life in shape? We all agree that mindset plays an important role in how we manage our money. And that's why we started this discussion by talking about our relationship with money, the emotions that guide the kind of financial decisions we make. So it's very important that we sit down and assess our beliefs and attitudes about money. I mentioned to you that I sat down and thought about mine and realized that it was led, what my financial decisions were based, basically based on fear, fear of losing. What if? What if I have nothing? So sit down and think about your beliefs, your attitude towards money. Is it helping you? Is it not helping you? Is there something that you can do about it? Until you are aware of it, it will be very difficult for you to do something about it. So self-awareness is key to any form of progress. Secondly, improve your knowledge when it comes to personal finances. Financial well-being is influenced by the kind of knowledge you have or financial literacy plus your financial sentiments or how you feel about money, the systems that you have put in place and your behaviors and habits. So you can't leave financial literacy out of the equation. You need to get knowledge about finances. And these days, there are very, there's a lot of information on personal finance, very simplified information on YouTube, everywhere you pass, as long as you're looking for it in books, uh, podcasts, wherever, as long as you are looking for it, you find it. So educate yourself. If it's too difficult, get yourself that friend that can break it down for you so that you can understand it's money. You want to understand it so that you can use it wisely. Also stay around people with a positive mind, money mindset. As I said, our environment affects the way we behave when it comes to money. I don't know if you've noticed, but when you're around people who spend money a lot, even if you are chisel, you realize that you end up spending more money than you intend to. When you are around people who are also very deliberate about their money, you spending without thinking, you kind of feel like you are not intentional or you may be, you don't, um, you, you don't believe in yourself too much as a result. So they wrap up on you. Your environment wraps up on you. So it's very important that you stay around people with a positive money mindset. As I said, yes, you've made a mistake. So what? We've all made mistakes. Forgive yourself if you make a money mistake. Stop comparing yourself to others. We are all caught in doing that, especially in this um, digital dispensation you just go on ig and you see your mates that you all finish school with while you are driving um something close to a bicycle the person is um probably driving a benz and you are wondering where you passed what happened to you our journeys are different our journeys are different as individuals sometimes the problem that person is carrying you can't carry half of it so stop comparing yourself to others. Be thankful for whatever you have because you are better off than other people. Somebody is walking, at least you have a bicycle to ride. So you should be thankful for that. It's very important. Not saying that you shouldn't be ambitious. Not saying that you shouldn't want more.
but don't compare yourself to others. Never compare yourself to others. Just look at your journey. How can you be better? As simple as that. Also be intentional about creating and maintaining good habits. Good habits are not easy to, to um, create or maintain. So if it's something that you really want to do, if you really want to budget, you have to be intentional about it. Sometimes it may mean having an accountability partner. Sometimes it may mean um, setting up systems like um, having a direct debit, automating things to make things easier for you because you know yourself. Whatever that is, make sure you are creating and maintaining good habits. Also understand that money is just a tool like fire. You can use fire for harm or you can use it for good. It is a tool and it reflects who we are as people. Give a good person money and he would end up multiplying or doing good things. Give a bad person money and we know how that is going to end. And so money is just a tool. Don't tie your value to the amount of money you have. It's just a tool to help you do what you need to do. It's as simple as that. If you don't have it, you're still of so much value. There's, uh, so just have that at the back of your mind and don't let anyone use your money to define you. Number two, it's important for you to set financial goals. And the reason why I hammer on this is I mentioned to you that I used to like saving a lot, but I never really had a reason why I, I save or invest. So I realized that what happens is I, um, an issue comes up, something that is not important to me, and I end up taking the money and spending it on something useless and end up re regretting it. By setting financial goals, you are telling your money that this is where I want you to go to because there are so many things that you can do. But once you set your financial goals and you prioritize, you can buy a car, you can travel, you can... Um, take a vacation, you can go to school, set all these goals, which ones are important to you and focus on those ones. Once you are done with the most important, you can move on to the next important thing. So it's very important to set financial goals because it helps you know where you are going and the kind of effort you should be putting in. As even you wake up in the morning, you sit in the car and you tell the Uber driver, take me anywhere. We know, that how, we know how that's going to end up, right? So it's very important that you know where you are going um, as a person. So sit down, think about your ultimate life. What do you want out of it? And think about the financial implication of these goals and um, set financial goals. And this will help you as to how to guide your money. And also, once you do this, you don't compare yourself to other people because you know where you are going. So very important. The next thing you want to do is create a budget. Budgeting is very, very, very important when it comes to your personal finances. Give me a minute. Let me sack my time quickly. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Budgeting is very important when it comes to our personal financing. Now, what is budgeting? Budgeting is simply a spending plan. When a lot of us hear budgeting, what comes to mind is, oh, not again. I have to sacrifice A, B, and C. I'm not in the mood for this. No. Budgeting is simply a spending plan. You are earning so much. By budgeting, you are telling your money where, to, where it should go instead of wondering where it went. So as I said, your budget should reflect your financial goals. If you put your expenses together and you realize that what you are spending on does not reflect where you want to go in life, then there's an issue. Your budgeting should reflect your priorities. That's why it's important for you to sit down and create a spending plan and make sure that your money goes where you want it to go. Very important. Also, spend less than you earn, no matter how much you earn. Even if you earn a billion and you don't spend less than you earn, you are poor. 
the moment your salary or your income is not paid, you are poor. You are poor. So it's very important that you spend less than you earn. Very important that you spend less than you earn so that you can create room for saving and investment. Also understand the difference between needs and wants. Needs are things that you need to survive, water, food, shelter. These are things that if you don't have will make your life very uncomfortable or you may even die, who knows. Wants are things like that vacation to, I don't know, the Maldives, um, wherever it is trending these days. You wouldn't die if you don't go. So those are wants. And we need to distinguish the difference between a need and a want. Most of the time, we want to make sure that our needs are catered for before we look at our wants. Very important. Some of us use our money to sort out our wants just to realize that we don't have enough for our needs. And that's what that's that's how we end up, you know, in debt, taking other people's money so that we can be able to sort out some of the needs. Meanwhile, we had money, but we ended up buying that nice bag with it. That nice bag, unfortunately, my sister is the one. Okay, plan for major expenses. Um, so you know um, that wedding is coming up, you know that child's school fees is coming up, you know that you want to do this for your child or do this in the next five years. Why do you wait till that um, time comes and then you start looking for money? That's when you start going in for all sorts of loans. Some of them are not favorable. Um, all sorts of interesting percentages per month. So it's very important that you sit down and look at your future. I know you don't have a picture of everything um, how the future is going to turn out, but have a picture of what you think you want in the future and be able to predict, okay, in the next five years, I want to do this, I want to do that. And then, okay, how much is it going to cost me? Can I start planning towards it rather than waiting for that to happen? That's how come a lot of us um, get, um, are not able to budget because you're just there and some expense that you've not planned for, that you knew was going to happen comes up and you are not prepared for it. Also track your expenses, especially if you are the type that likes spending and you can't tell where your money went. It's important that you track your expenses. And let me give you an example. One day I put 200 CDs in my purse and I, I don't like keeping cash in my, my bag anyway, but I put 200 CDs in my purse and by the time I go home, it was done. I bought a little cake here, a little that here. It, didn't, it looked quite harmless by the time I realized it was done. And I will feel like, ah, I didn't do anything with my money. How come it's finished? Because there are certain things that I spent on which seem minor, but when it all adds up, may have a huge implication on my budget. So please track your expenses. Boost your income. So important. I think we are in 2021. You don't actually need to go to an office to work. There are all sorts of ways you can make money. I think the reason for um, this um, seminar anyway. Um, we are learning digital skills that we can leverage on to be able to make money. Now you can be in your house and be selling clothes to somebody in another place. One lady I buy my kids clothes from is um, a housewife. She stays at home, takes pictures of the stuff, and then um, you order, the delivery guy picks it up, and then she's making some money. So boost your income. There's so much that you can do as an individual. So I think these days we don't have too much of an excuse like we could have before this whole digitization. So let's keep on looking for opportunities to make more income. You can even um, teach people a skill that you have. Maybe you're so good at cooking. Maybe some of us are terrible at it and you would like to teach us how to cook some okra stew or palm not to, you know, and all of that. These are all things that you can make money from. You can cook for some bachelors. There are so many things that um, you can do. So just think about all the opportunities to make money, kick fear out and go out there and make the money. Also, as I've already said, beware of keeping up with the Joneses. It's not going to help you if you keep on um, comparing yourself to somebody and you know, doing what you cannot do just to impress people who probably don't care. 
Then also beware of lifestyle inflation. So lifestyle inflation basically is, okay, so now you are stay at home mom. Maybe you were in NN March, you had a thousand Ghana CDs being paid to you, um, or let's say two hundred dollars or something being paid to you on a monthly basis. And now you decide to, I mean, take charge and do something, whether it's an online business or whatever, you decide to do something and now you have five thousand CDs coming in. All of a sudden your taste bars change. You are no longer interested in um kinky and fish, you now want um, dollar from some particular restaurant. You can't wear a shoe from this shop anymore. You have to upgrade, you know, because you have upgraded. And all you have to change your car because, you know, this is no longer fitting. That is lifestyle inflation. It means that you have increased your lifestyle to match up with your new income. So this is something we have to be careful about because the reason why we are making more income is so that we can even though I still encourage you to enjoy life, please, I encourage you to enjoy life when you have money. Also beware that this is a good advantage for you to save more, invest more, make money, expand your business, do that retirement um, plan, um, take on that insurance. This is the time. This is the opportunity. So forget about that Hermes bag, unfortunately. Use the bag that you have and, you know, make the most of whatever new income is coming in. Very important. Okay. Okay, so this is just a sample of um, a budget. So um, this is for a salaried worker. So you have the salary 3,800 coming in, the side hustle 700. So you can look at it as maybe um, you get some allowance, um, maybe 2,000, you have a little business bringing 500, you have this, you have that. So all your inflows, you, you record them and total them. And then you can look at the various expenses. So you can also even do this as a family. You can look at the various expenses and then also make sure that in your budget, you feature savings as an expense so that you are not waiting for the coins that is left to save. So you treat your savings as an expense, so you are more intentional about saving. So this is just an example of a budget. Okay, now it's very important that yes, we have budgeted, we are living within our means, but it's not enough. It's not enough to just save, it's not enough. But before I go to why it's not enough, it's important, as I said, to automate your savings. Um, I've been working in the in this retirement industry for a while. And one thing I noticed is we have different kinds of people. So we have people who come in and say, oh, I'm serious about my retirement. Give me a direct debit. Let me fill it and take my money at this, on this date every month. And we have those who say, oh, I'll sign up. I'll pay. Uh, I'll go to the bank and pay on my own. And those who say they'll go and pay on their own, 90% percent of them don't end up paying because somehow some way somehow we know how life is something will just come up and that money will be gone so if you want to be very deliberate about your savings have an automated plan so that at every month even before you you, you realize that money is taking out that will help you to be able to build that savings habit also in also the same with investment now, as I said, plan for major expenses. So you know your child will be going to school or doing A, B, or C in the next five years. You can invest towards it. So these are some of the things that you would like to list and invest. Investing towards it make, means that you also make some interest income in addition to whatever you are contributing, which will make the goal more likely to achieve. It's also important that as your investment base goes, you diversify your invest investment. You don't put all your eggs in one basket. The reason being that if something happens to that one basket, all your money has gone down the drain. And um, most of us here are Ghanaian, so we know about the men's growth situation. We'll say that those who diversified their investment but still had some money in men's gold probably were not part of those who died as a result of men's gold going down. It was probably those 
who had all their money there or borrowed somebody's money to go and put there. So it's important that you diversify your investment so that you are less exposed to one investment. Also review your savings and investment plan regularly. A lot of us save and then we just leave it. Um, I remember I had a savings account in one of the banks and I realized they were always deducting e-charges e or e-something and the money was rather reducing, not increasing. But you would say you have a savings account and you are cool with it. It's important for you to be tracking. Does it fit whatever purpose you put you, you set it up for? If it doesn't, then there's a need for a change. And when it comes to investment, time is of essence because of something we call um, compound interest. I'm sure I'll show you something about that later. So it's very important that you start now. And as I said, you don't need a billion to start. You can start with as low as 50 CDs, 100 CDs, and some investments, even 20 CDs and five CDs. You can start with the little you have. So don't say you don't have enough. Start with the little you have, build the habits, so that when you have more income coming in, these are habits you've already built, will be very easy for you to continue. Now, investments that I think that, or savings accounts or investments, I think we should all have at least, is one, an emergency fund. An emergency fund will cover emergencies, obviously. Like if you had a job loss, some of us have probably suffered a job loss, that's the reason why we are home. If you have an emergency fund, at least that can sort you out for a while while you look for something else to do. And an emergency fund um, is simply um, recommended three to six months of your living expenses that you set aside in a savings account or an easily accessible investment um, account. Three to six months is a rule of thumb. However, how much you put in there is based on your situation. So if you're probably working in an industry where getting a job um, is difficult, then you probably want to do more. If you are in a job where getting it is very difficult for you to lose your job or getting a job is very easy, probably you are in the IT space, getting a job is very easy, then three to six months is enough. And this will cover job loss, illness, if there's an issue with your car or any emergency. You can cover it without having to go and borrow or dipping into any of your investment funds that you have set aside for other purposes. Also start a retirement fund. As I said, women live longer than men. No matter how vibrant you are today, if God blesses us with long life, you're definitely going to retire tomorrow. How are you going to survive when you retire, are you going to be that lady who was driving the Mercedes Benz, but because you didn't plan for retirement, you have to sell it for a motor, for, um, you can't drive a motorbike when you are that old, but you have to sell it um, just because you didn't plan for your retirement. So it's very, very important. And so much, so, so many times we see people who were living good lives, but didn't plan for retirement and they are not able to maintain their standard of living. Also save for short-term and long-term goals. So you want to go to school, start saving for it. You want to change your car, start saving for it. You want to buy a house, start saving for it. You want whatever it is you want, write it down and see how best you can start saving for it. You can have what we call sinking funds. Sinking funds is an account that you set aside for a particular purpose. So maybe vacation, 2022, you start saving for it rather than wait for it and then and go and borrow to go to the Maldives. I, I don't know why you do that, but just to see. So what kind of investments are available? Now, let me say there are so many investment options available. And um, we have the financial assets like the regular T-bills, bonds, stocks, those things. You can um, invest in your own business is an investment and building a house to sell or rent is an investment. But all these investments have different implications that you should take into consideration. And I'll touch on that. And bonds are normally debt securities issued. It could be issued by government. Um, that's why we have treasury bonds. Or it could also be issued by a corporate institution as a way of um, raising funds for whatever 
um, project or whatever it is, operational expenses that um, they need to make. And bonds are normally long term. T bills are the same. That one is issued by the government, but T bills are normally short term. So with T bills, you have three months, six months. Um, um, the one year is called the T note. Then we have stocks. I spoke about shares. You are interested in MTN. You think they have so much prospect. You want uh, 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 you want to benefit from that outlook, that positive outlook. You can buy MTN shares and also benefit from it. You can benefit in terms of dividends. That is when profit is made and they share it among stock um, shareholders. Or you can also benefit from capital appreciation. That is when the price of your share, maybe you bought it at 5 CD, but now it's 10 CD. That means when you sell it, you are getting double of what you, you put in there. So all those, all that is investment. Anything you do to um, grow your money, to create value for you. We have fixed deposit. These are normally issued by financial institutions like banks, savings and loans, um, those institutions that are licensed by Bank of Ghana. Now, I'll say that with fixed deposits, um, normally the bank, some banks will give lower rates than the treasury bill. Um, so you can look at which one works for you because treasury bills are considered the safest form of investment because it's issued by government. So you're saying at least government can print money if you know they are unable to pay. And we have the savings and loans, microfinance, they would normally give higher interest rates, but that's because of the risk that may be associated with them. So these are things that you need to take into consideration. We have mutual funds. I love mutual funds. I think <laughs> almost all, if not all my investments are mutual funds because mutual funds give you an avenue to save as little as possible uh, or to be part of or, or to diversify, even though you have very little. So you can put 100 CDs in a mutual fund, but be doing a bit of stock, a bit of bonds, a bit of treasury bills, a bit of this and a bit of that. What is a mutual fund? It's a pool of funds. So different people come together, they all contribute. We have a pool of funds that we can go and um, buy different investments or different assets as a result. So we all benefit from the returns that come out of that investment. So investments that you couldn't have afforded as an individual with mutual funds, you can do that. Real estate, in Ghana, we like real estate a lot, but it's not as straightforward as it looks. So I always say that if you want to invest in the real estate space, seek advice, seek advice, very important, because you may go and build some nice mansion in some far away place and the rent that you get from that it would have been better if you had put your money in t bills so seek advice let the person know whatever your goals are if you need help with that you can contact me i know a real estate advisor who would um ask you for your what your goals before she gives you any advice and um, business business it's also an investment. As I said, anything you put your money in. So you can start with something small. I have a friend who said she started her business with one CD. I don't know how true that is. But now um, her business has expanded. So you can start with something small and then, you know, it, it expands as you go along. Um, and then when it comes to business, please make sure that you're not doing business because your friend is doing business. No. Do do what you are good at, research, do the hard work. Um, don't just, oh, the, your, business, your water business is what is trending, so you go into it. The, the factors that determine the success of a business uh, for one person, you may not know. You may just go into it blindly and end up losing money. So please do your research before you go into business. And if possible, it should be something that you're excited about because it can get tough. Pension funds, where I'm from. So um, you can invest with, I'll be talking more about this, the exit pension plan or any other pension funds. They are all investments that you can also um, tap into. So as I said, before you choose the um, right investment, know the time horizon. What stage in life are you? If you're somebody who is not married, you don't have kids, 
definitely the kind of investment would, that you can do will be different from somebody who has kids and has school fees to pay. Also, how long do you plan investing for? If you want to just invest for three months, it may not make sense going to buy shares because at the time you need your money, maybe the share prices would have gone down. So all of these determine the kind of investment you want to do. Um, some of these goals are marriage, home, family, education, retirement, preserving your capital or um, asset accumulation, planning for uncertainty, etc. So these are some of the goals that um, you can use to invest. Also, your risk appetite. How much risk are you comfortable with? Some of us think that we can take risks until we take the risk and the money disappears and then we are asked to the hospital and then you realize you are risk averse. So the question you should ask yourself is the money I am investing, okay? If I lose it, am I going to be comfortable with it? If your answer is no, you are probably risk averse. So go with more secure investments. Otherwise, you can also take risk with a little part of your portfolio, let me say your overall fund, and then keep the bunch of it invested in something that you are comfortable with. At least if you're investing 100 CDs, you put 10 CDs in something that you think is risky and you don't, and you lose that 10 CDs, at least you have your 90 CDs that you can fall back on. There are people who um, are very risk tolerant, if that is you, taking into consideration your life stage and it makes sense, go for it. But also make sure that you have some money just in case things don't go well. You are at least able to eat and cater for yourself. Um, your age also comes to play. If you are near retirement, it may not make sense to be taking too much risk. Also your liquidity needs. As I've said, if you want to get married in three months, um, it's not, it doesn't make sense when do shares because at the time you're getting married, that money may not be there because maybe the prices are not good at that moment. So it's all important as well as your current income, the rate of return, inflation, all these things come to play. Now I mentioned compound interest and why it's important to start investing in. So let's take two people, Mrs. A and Mrs. B. Now, Mrs. A started in setting aside 500 CDs a month, and she did that for 10 years and decided that she, uh, she's taking a career break so um, she can no longer continue contributing. And Mrs. B, on the other hand, when Mrs. A was doing it, said, oh, I mean, I'm not nearing retirement now, so let me enjoy, you know, what I have. And when I'm getting closer, I'll do something. So Mrs. B started investing when she was 40 and they all invested till they were 60. So that means Mrs. A did um, for 10 years, 30 to 40, left her money in for the rest of the 20 years. Mrs. B started when she was 40 and then kept on investing the same amount of money, 500 for 15 years. At retirement, Mrs. A will have 3.5 5 million, assuming interest rates are 18% averagely, and Mrs. B will have 830, 863,000. Remember that Mrs. B did 15 years, Mrs. A did 10 years. But what happened is the timing of the fund that may, made a difference of 2.6 million. That's why I said start now. Timing is very important. And this is just a simulation to give you an idea of how something small, as, as small as 100 CDs over a long period can make so much money for you. So let's, as, let's assume you have that 100 CDs you've been looking down on. You are probably, let's say 30, and, um, or let me say 35, and you'll be retiring in the next um, 25 years. If you set 100 CDs aside for the next 25 years, at an average interest rate of 18%, without touching it, leaving it, just leave it to keep on being invested, you can take about 573,000 Ghana CDs away when you are going on retirement. And if you do the calculation, I think it will be about, um, 
maybe 30,000, you can do your calculation. It will be about, it may be about 30,000 Ghana cities that you've invested with your own money. But because you invested that money, that money may be returns. You reinvested the returns. The returns also may be returns. That has also made returns. That has also made returns. You realize that your small money has gone a long way to ensure that you retire comfortably. Another thing is that you should plan for a comfortable retirement. First and foremost, set retirement goals. What kind of retirement do you want to have? You can look at it in terms of the kind of income you want to earn. So maybe 10,000 a month, or you can also look at it as maybe certain capital expenses you want to make. I want to go to the Maldives. I want to buy myself a Benz, whatever it is, have retirement goals. Also take into consideration where you are now in terms of the assets that you have, what you own as an individual, what you can easily liquidate, and the liabilities that you have, the things you owe. If we sell what you have or what you own and what you owe, would there be something left? It is very important that you know this. Also evaluate your uh, financial situation. Are you spending less than you earn? Is there room to do something extra towards your retirement? Also access your retirement prospects. A lot of us have taken career breaks. Probably you were paying social security before you took a, a career break. And all these things would have um, an implication on our final retirement outcome. It may mean that some of us, if we don't get another employment and start paying our SNIT and other um, towards other retirement funds, we may not get something decent when we go on retirement. Mind you, even though you are on, you are working for yourself or you are a stay at home mom, you can actually still contribute towards your SNIT. You can actually still contribute towards your retirement. You can contribute towards your SNIT um, as a self-employed person. That is if you're in Ghana. I don't know about the situation elsewhere, but you can contribute towards your SNIT as a self-employed person. And you can still contribute to, um, to your personal pension plan. So these are things that you should be taking advantage of. Go and get your SNIT statement. Know what the situation is now. How many months have you contributed to SNIT? How many months are left for you to be able to achieve the minimum 15 years requirement to get access to a pension in Ghana? What is your tier two situation looking like? Are you going to get a decent lump sum when you go on retirement? These are all things you should be looking at. Don't wait till you retire for life to happen to you. And if you need help, with any retirement needs, you can reach out to me. I'll help you with how to get back on track with regards to your retirement planning. Also, you do all these assessments and you realize that you are behind. You can set a retirement for your pension plan in motion. Start doing something towards your retirement. Don't wait to depend on your children. If you are living in Ghana, you know that times are hard. Planning to depend solely on your children, for me, I feel like it's wickedness. So for me, do something. And at least, even if you receive the least support, you can be comfortable. Even better, you can even support your children when you go on retirement. The finance minister says there are no jobs. Children should now, we should uh, start uh, looking at entrepreneurship. These people have just left school. How are they going to look at entrepreneurship? They will need people to support. And that is one of the reasons why you need to take your finances more seriously. Also, the fact that you've done a personal pension plan, you are paying your SNIT, doesn't mean that is it. You need to review and monitor your retirement plan. Make sure that it's in accordance with whatever goals you have set for yourself. Otherwise, there may be a need to do some tweaks and changes here and there. Let me leave these few tips for you. The law allows you to, the Ghanaian law, allows you to do up to 35% um, uh, of your money or of your income in, of your basic salary in um, retirement funds. Part of that 18.5% goes towards net mandatory, especially if you're in the formal sector, 5% towards tier two. That leaves 16.5% for 
the tier three, which is the voluntary um, fund. So it's important that you max out your retirement savings, all the 16.5. This is free money that is going to the government because some of you are looking for jobs. Some of you will end up going um, back to um, jobs. And these are all things that you should be taking advantage of. If you're a self-employed person and you are paying your income taxes, especially as this Ghana card um, situation seeks to close the tax gap, it probably means you'll be paying taxes. If you want to benefit, you need to take advantage of this DPS pension scheme I'm talking about. And because of time, I didn't put too much in there, but on a later date, or you can call me, I'll tell you a bit more about um, the, the scheme. But whatever tax savings opportunities are available, make sure that as a person, you are taking advantage of it. Apart from what the, the mandatory scheme, which is the SNIT scheme and the tier two scheme, and um, also make sure that you are doing at least about 10% of your income towards your retirement. It's important to have an emergency fund. I mentioned why. I mentioned that you should plan for capital expenses. Also in planning, remember that there's the almighty inflation to deal with. Um, also remember healthcare costs. Some of us are being covered by our husbands, um, health insurance and all that. Once they stop working, we have to take care of our own health care because these are things that we should be thinking about. Longevity, and I'm talking about it, that we are more likely to live long. Look at the oldest person in your family. If you're supposed to live as long, are you going to endure or you're going to enjoy? Also, increase your contribution as your income increases, and this will help you with lifestyle inflation. Also, avoid withdrawing from your retirement savings to go and throw that party take that photo shoot or do all those things. No, let your retirement fund be for what it has been meant for retirement. Also monitor and then also start saving towards your retirement. These are the last tips that I'll leave with you. Beware of bad debt. So um, debt on its own is not bad, even though it's, it's risky to take debt because you, are, you have an obligation to pay. It is not bad if you're using that money, other people's money, to generate more wealth. But if you're going to use it to buy a car so that you can show your friends or uh, for a party for your kids, and that doesn't mean just going to the bank. All the IOUs and all those things, all those things are debt, okay? Then it's not worth it. If you're going to take debt for consumption, then it's not worth it. If you can't afford a, a, a party for your child, buy pizza, buy Coke, blow bubbles. I don't know. You can make something very simple, very exciting. So you don't need to go all out if you don't have the money. So beware of bad debt. Don't take loans for consumables. You can take loans to um, improve your wealth, but always make sure that you are able to pay whether or not that thing that you're using the loan for works, you are able to pay. So uh, make sure you do that before you go ahead to take the loan. And even if you're using the loan for something good, don't go and take too much that you can handle. Just because the bank says you can take up to 50,000, doesn't mean go and take up to 50,000. Take what you can handle according to what your budget allows you to. Also protect yourself and your assets. And doing all these things, unfortunately, we have to deal with risk. Um, risk that your car may have an accident, risk that your house could get bent, risk that you could, God forbid, die before um, your children are able to take care of themselves, and all these things. So you need to ensure yourself to make sure that no matter what happens, you are, that is, if it's in case of your property, you are indemnified. You can go back to where you, you, you were left off before that thing happened. If also it's in terms of your life and you were also bringing in something, maybe you're doing some business, bringing in some money and it was helping improve the life of the family by taking a life insurance, even though you are gone and the children may miss you emotionally, they will not miss you financially because um, the, the insurance 
is paying something that they can use to take care of whatever it is that you were taking care of when you were around. So this is very important. You see a lot of uh, people die and um, their children suffer um, because they didn't plan. And we all don't know where we will go. Our prayer is that we live for long, but just in case, make sure you have an insurance. I know we don't like talking about this, but well, it's part of life. Also, you've worked so hard, you've done, you have your um, emergency fund, you have your savings account, you have your investments, your business, your real estate, um, every, you put everything in place. It's nice, but we are not going to be here forever. Whether you die at whatever age or you die at 150, you're still going to exit this earth. So it's important that you plan your estate. Don't go and then from heaven, hopefully, you see your children who you love so much and you thought you taught them to love themselves, fighting over some plot of land that you left and you didn't assign to anybody. So make sure that as you are acquiring these things as a family or as an individual, you are um, writing that will um, updating your beneficiaries, doing whatever you need to do so that when you are in heaven, you can actually enjoy without wondering what you did when you were here on earth. I'll say that you can start slow, you can start small, but you have to start now. And this is a quote from an unknown person. And I think this is so important for those of us who are on the call today because we may feel like we, we are not in a good enough place, but trust me, you are in a good enough place. Everything in life is for a purpose. So start slow. You don't need to start like your friend has, has started. No, start slow. You can start small. Little steps matter, but start now. Start now. Remember that each one of us has enough. We, we have what we need to survive. It's about our mindset. If you feel like you don't have enough, you will never have enough. If you feel like you have enough, you will make the most of the little that you have. Let me end by saying that in Access Pension Plan, we have um, in Access Pension Trust, we have the Access Pension Plan and the um, Access Micro Pensions for individuals to save towards their retirement. And I'll encourage all of us, all of us to take advantage.